Okay, we're going to look at acid-based chemistry metabolism. This is really important stuff, not only for the MCAT, but also for medical school as well. That's because, of course, metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis, these are seriously clinical problems that are derived from perturbations in a number of things, such as the respiratory system or the renal system, et cetera. So we'll take a look at some general chemistry principles. We'll move into more biochemical, and we'll take a look at some of the physiological things that actually deal with these problems itself. So most people think of acids and bases in the context of bronze lowery acid bases. That's probably a good place to be. So bronze lowery acids donate protons into bases except protons. One of the limitations is that the system only focuses on protons. We're going to see two other systems, the Arrhenius system, as well as Lewis acids and bases in a moment. So we all know hydrochloric acid is a very uh, strong uh, acid, that along with HI, HBr, perchloric acid, H2SO4, and nitric acid formulate the family of very strong acids that are completely dissociated. Their equilibrium constants are really large. And in fact, you probably never even see anything listed. They're commonly considered to be infinite because there is no lack of dissociation. So what you see is that the chloride conjugate base here, this is a weak conjugate base because it comes from a strong acid. There's no incentive for this to come back together to form hydrochloric acid or HCl. But in contrast, acetic acid is considered to be a weak acid and it dissociates into its strong acetate conjugate base. And so some of it can go back to the actual acetic acid form itself, although it's partially dissociated. The equilibrium constant is 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. It's classified as weak because it does not completely dissociate. And here is the equilibrium expression. You should learn how to write these because we'll be solving some acid-based problems with this. And the pKa, of acetic acid or the negative log of the equilibrium Ka constant is 4.75. It's probably one you should commit to memory. So here's a problem that uses conjugate bases, their strengths in the context of leaving groups. And so what we see here is a family of alkyl halides here. There's one with, a, there's an iodine, chloride, bromide, fluoride. We react them in the presence of a strong base as well as uh, a ketone here. This is actually dimethyl ketone, commonly known as acetone. And notice how we get alcohol products that are all the same. And so the question becomes, well, what's the relative rate of product formation? Is it the same for each one? Is there a difference? And if there is a difference, how do you figure it out? So what you should appreciate is that this is an SN2 type of reaction. It's done in a polar A product solvent. And you should think of product solvents as hydrogen bond donors, that is water and ethanol, but an aprotic solvent like acetone cannot be a hydrogen bond donor. It could be an acceptor, but it's a polar aprotic solvent, which is ideal conditions for SN2. These secondary carbons here are attacked by the strong base, which serves a nucleophile, and you kick out the leaving group to form the alcohol Notice that the product is inverted configuration. We go from a wedge to a hatch line here. Okay, fine. So what we should recognize is that in the order of strength of halogenated acids, we say HI, HBr, HCl, HF. Definitely memorize that. HF is actually not a strong acid. It's the weakest of all the halogen acids. And so what we know that if we have a strong acid, we must have a weak conjugate base. So the weakest conjugate base will be iodide and then bromide here. And since weak bases weakly share their electrons, what that means is that they're easier to displace by the actual nucleophile, which is the OH. So basically what you should keep in mind is that the weakest conjugate base is always the best leaving group. Okay, that's a very important concept to know. So we can also apply some of these concepts about leaving groups in the context of proteolysis here. And so what we see is a peptide bond. This, here's the carbonyl with the nitrogen here. So we have an amide, a peptide bond here, being hydrolyzed by water and some hypothetical peptidase. And so water as a nucleophile can be made stronger by pulling off this 
proton here and generating OH minus because hydroxide is a stronger base, a stronger nucleophile than water. The way this is done is by having lysine here pull this proton off. And so what lysine does, it accepts the proton, so it must be acting as a base. And as a consequence, when it does that, we generate a more, a better nucleophile. Notice how the serine here has actually hydrogen bonded with the carbonyl. We've given it a partial positive charge, which actually causes a oxygen to pull more electrons towards itself. So by performing this reaction where you have the base pulling off the proton from water and having this hydrogen bonding event, you're actually facilitating the rate of the reaction. So we form our tetrahedral intermediate, it collapses, and in order to cleave the peptide bond, we have to have this, nit this CN bond broken. So we're gonna have this nitrogen leaving group here. And so if you compare NH versus NH2, that is NH2 where it has the actual hydrogen that's still stuck to the nitrogen via the lysine hydrogen bond, what you can do is compare RNH minus versus RNH2 as a leaving group. And of course, RNH2 is a weaker base. And so what you see is that that leaves and you form an amine and you have a carboxylic acid. And so of course you appreciate that the hydrolysis of an amide gives you a carboxylic acid and an amine. So the strength of leaving groups is seen in the catalysis. So you're gonna see a lot of acid-based problems. You've probably solved these in GCAM before and the MCAT's notorious for these as well. And, and the simplest starter question is, what is the pH of a 0.2 molar solution of a weak acid given its actual uh, equilibrium constant, Ka is 1.8 times 10 to the minus four. You see the answer choices are 1.3, 2.2, 3.4, and 4.1. And so how do you figure that out? So we know it's a weak acid. It will not completely dissociate at equilibrium. So what you do is you set up an ice table. And the ice table has the initial, the change, and the equilibrium or the final values for everything in solution using this generic acid dissociation equation here. And so I set up a table for initial change in final or equilibrium. And what you notice is that the HA is 0.2 molar as given. The H plus we call 10 to the minus seven, but many tables were gonna call that zero. I wanted to point this out to you that 10, it's actually a real number, but since 10 to the minus seven, which is the auto ionization for water, is so much smaller than 10 to the minus four, it's almost a thousand fold smaller basically, it's considered to be negligible. The initial amount of conjugate base is zero, but in equilibrium, we lose some HA, we have minus X, we gain protons and we gain conjugate base in stoichiometric amounts that we call X. And so the final equilibrium concentrations are 0.2 minus X for the acid, and the plus X and plus X for the protons as well as the conjugate base. What you do is you plug them into the equilibrium expression, you solve algebraically, you get X squared equals 3.6 times 10 to the minus five. You get X equals 0 0.006, and now you're kind of stuck because you're like, well, hold on a second. The pH is the negative log of 0 0.006. I can't use a calculator, so what am I gonna do? I'm gonna use extrapolation. So we know that if it's 0 0.001, it's going to be a pH of 3. And if it's 0 0.01, it's a pH of 2. And six point oh oh six lies in the middle, we extrapolate the answer must be between 1 and 2. It's choice B or 2.2. So, you know, MCAT math is going to use a lot of these tricks. And so what you should do is be prepared to extrapolate, to round up, and to solve these problems fast. So then let's move over to Arrhenius acids and bases. Arrhenius acids only deal with water as the solvent. That is, they say that you increase protons in solution if you're an acid, you increase hydroxide if you're a base. So it's limited because water is the only solvent. Of course, you can have dissociation of protons in solutions that are not aqueous, like toluene, for example, but the Arrhenius 
uh, system doesn't focus on that. And then there's the Lewis acid based concept, which is really a discussion about electron pairs, acceptors, and donors, which translate into nucleophiles and electrophiles. So for here, you see ammonia. This is a base. Here's the lone pair of electrons. This is a Lewis base, so it has a non bonding pair of electrons. You recognize that as nucleophilic. But over here, the Lewis acid is really an electrophile because it's short of its octet. Here's BF3. It's basically wanting a pair of electrons. So it's an electrophile. So it's want, gonna wanna mate with a nucleophile. So the Lewis acid base system is really the concept of nucleophiles and electrophiles. And here's a summary of all three of them. And you should definitely know this for the MCAT because they're gonna move in and out of this. So let's talk about the strength of acids. And we think about the strength of acids, we think about the pKa. Now the pKa is the negative log of the Ka. So if hydrochloric acids, Ka is super duper large, its pKa will be very, very small. So that means that very small pKa values represent strong acids. We know that the pKa plus the pKb is 14. And the auto ionization of water is Kw is 10 to the minus 14. So water is a weak acid. So let's take a look at a, a couple situations over here. Here's tyrosine. Here's an aromatic alcohol, serine, an aliphatic alcohol, a spartic acid, a typical carboxylic acid. And here we have the imidazole side chain of histidine can be protonated and deprotonated. So there's an acid and a conjugate base as well. So the strength of acids, when you think about pKa values, think about this. So tyrosine has a pKa of 10. It's an aromatic alcohol, but the aliphatic alcohol serine has a pKa of 14. So the reason why tyrosine, this is a stronger acid, is because we dissociate this proton, these electrons can be resonant stabilized, whereas the aliphatic serine doesn't have the luxury of aromaticity. Aspartic acid has a pKa of three. That's a typical value for a carboxylic acid. You may see some tables have pKa values of two, and then you should ask, well, why is that? And the answer is, because the pKa values can change as a function of the environment that you're in, which could be due to ionic strength and the dielectric constant. You should know the generic general numbers for aspartic acid is two to three range, as opposed to memorizing it's two or three itself. Histidine is unique because its pKa value for the imidazole side chain is actually the closest there is to physiological pH. And so what you'll see commonly on the MCAT is manipulations of the henderson hasselbach equation. It's written several ways. One way it's written is the pH equals pKa plus the log of the conjugate base over the acid. Now, here we have a question of what is the fraction of histidine residues that are positively charged at pH 7.4? We can solve it with the formula, which we'll see in a minute. But when you see this question, you should immediately think of a couple things so you know what type of answer to expect. And the idea here is that if the pH is 7.4 and the pKa is 6.4, that's one unit given the fact it's a log scale, that means they're gonna be 10 times the value. So when we think that the pH is past the pKa, what we've done is we've titrated those protons off one unit beyond the pKa means there's going to be a tenfold difference. So the idea then is that we know that 90% because it's tenfold are going to be in the actual conjugate base form. So 10% of the histidines at pKa 6.4 in a 7.4 pH solution will be protonated. You should familiarize yourself with the henderson hasselbeck formula and get into the habit of solving them. In many cases, I argue, they're gonna give you pKa values and pH values. They're gonna be easily manipulable 
In this case, I showed you a difference of one, but you can get two as well. So let's look at some titrations. We've seen some with amino acids previously, but now we'll look at some G-chem, go over a couple more amino acids, and then we'll talk about acid-based chemistry in the context of metabolism and metabolic acidosis as well as alkalosis. So when we titrate a strong acid and a strong base, like we take HCl and we add NaOH to it, at the equivalence point, when the number of moles of acid equals the number of moles of base, what we have in this case is a neutral salt. Okay, so sodium chloride is a neutral salt and you have water. So the equivalence point for strong acid and strong base is seven. Now, some people are gonna call this the neutral point and it's dangerous to do that because in many acid-base titrations, the equivalence point, when the number of moles of base equals the number of moles of acid, the pH is not neutral. It's only neutral for a strong acid with a strong base. And so I show you a graphical representation of the different types. Notice here the titration is with volume of acid added where the previous one was with base. So here we start out at a high pH, strong base is titrated with a strong acid. Our equivalence point as expected is pH seven, but when you titrate a weak base and a weak acid, your equivalence point is actually below seven. So that's why you don't wanna call that a neutral point. It's not a good idea because it's misleading. Strong base weak acid gives you an equivalence point above seven and a weak base and a strong acid gives you equivalence point that's acidic. So you should definitely get into the habit of understanding what the actual pH at the equivalence point will be where the equivalence is defined is when the moles of acid equals the moles of base. So here's a titration here. Uh, we have a compound titrated as shown and we want to know what the Ka value of the compound is. So we can determine the Ka value of the compound. We can determine the pKa value as well. So what do we see here? We see a decrease in pH as we add our titrant. So we must be titrating a weak base and an acid because the pH decreases. And what you see here at the inflection point is the actual pKb. And over here, what you have is a pOH equals 10 because it's a weak base. And if the pOH equals 10, the pH must equals four because pOH plus pH always equals 14. And what you can do is use the formulas down here and solve and get the Ka value is 10 to the minus four. And we can also titrate amino acids. And so the question is, what amino acid is this? And so you take a look at this, what we're doing is we're adding base. As expected, the pH goes up. We have basically a pKa here. We go up, have another pKa. These inflection points, you have a pKa there. It's a triprotic amino acid. It can't be glycine, okay? It's not glutamine. So, but what it could be is lysine, and it could also be arginine for that matter. And so what we see here are the three pKa's of lysine. So in the beginning, we have uh, a completely protonated species that has a plus two charge to it. As we start to titrate, what happens, we lose the carboxyl first because this has the lowest pKa value. And then as we move up, we lose the alpha amino group over here, and as we keep titrating with base, we end up losing the proton that is with the epsilon amino side chain of lysine there. And so this raises the concept of the isoelectric point. I remember we did this with amino acids, but it never hurts to go over many times. So here I've taken the glycine amino acid here. It's the only, um, Basically, there's, this is not a chiral carbon, so it's a chiral. These are two hydrogens. You can't see them there, but they're implied. And so at a really low pH, everything's protonated. That means everything being the amino as well as the carboxyl. So it has basically a cationic character to it. But as we add base to it, we end up titrating off this pro carboxyl proton completely. And we're at the Zwitter ionic state, which is the 
isoelectric point is the point where there's no charge in the molecule, it's neutral. So as we add more base to it, we end up pulling off these amino protons because they're PKAs in the nine to 10 range. And then we end up with an anionic species over here. So the idea then is to recognize that when the pH is higher than the PI, you're gonna have more anionic negative character. If the PI is greater than the pH, you're gonna be more positively charged with more cationic behavior. So the idea then is that you can apply this to peptides and the MCAS notorious for this, where you determine the net charge of the peptide at any given pH. And so some of the questions that people have gone over are what is the isoelectric point of arginine, a triprotic amino acid with three side chains that can be ionized. And here is the values here. And so what you do is you look at that and what you should recognize is that what you do is you average the two light groups, which is this alpha amino group over here and this guanidinium group over here. And so if the amino acid was a spartate, you would average the two carboxyl groups to get the isoelectric point. So what about relative pKa values? Here's a question for you. Which of the following forms of serine would fail to exist at any pH? And so what you do is you see all these four forms you look at. This one's neutral. Over here is a plus minus. Okay, that's the Zwitter ionic form. That's the isoelectric form. Over here, we have two carboxyls that have been ionized and an NH2 that's been ionized. That's gotta be the high pH form over here. And over here is an acidic form where everything has its proton, it's positively charged. But when you look at it, there's one of them that doesn't make any sense. And of course, it's going to be A, because in this case, what has happened with A is you've lost the amino proton, which has a higher pKa before you lose the carboxyl proton, which has a pKa of two. You would never have this form exist in solution, despite the fact you see people sloppily represent that in books as well as other things. So think about that. So let's take a look at buffering systems in the body for pH. The most important one is carbonic acid buffering system. There's an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. And we have a passage we're going to do in our workshop. It's also in our Q bank that actually looks at altitude sickness and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. The one prescribed by docs is, uh, is called Diamox. I took it when I went to Mount Everest. And so it's a really interesting drug. So, so what happens is CO2 and water combine and form carbonic acid. It's catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase. And then that's a weak acid that dissociates into bicarbonate and protons. So then what we can see from this equation is that the more CO2 that we have, we can push this equilibrium to the right by the Chatelier's principle. We can ultimately generate protons. And what you should recognize is that carbon dioxide is acidic, okay? So let's take a look at what happens in the body. So we have uh, actively metabolizing tissue. It could be your skeletal muscle running that marathon. And glucose is being oxidized to acetyl-CoA and hopefully you're gonna be aerobic when this happens. And if that's the case, what you can do is completely oxidize carbon through the mitochondrial TCA cycle into CO2. And CO2, it, yes, it's soluble in the blood by Henry's law, but it diffuses also. And as it diffuses, it goes into the red blood cell that's carrying oxygen and hemoglobin. And that CO2 is gonna be converted into carbonic acid through the red blood cells carbonic anhydrase enzyme. And then that when that dissociates as proton, what happens is that the acidic environment, it can bind to he oxygen and hemoglobin, which releases oxygen in the presence of protons. That's called the good old fashioned force shift. And so what you see is that we can actually take away the CO2 that's acidic and buffer it with releasing oxygen. There's also metabolic acidosis. The common one that you'll see is lactic acidosis. And this is, uh, occurs when the mitochondria cannot oxidize pyruvate into acetyl-CoA 
and the TCA cycle. So this could happen under anaerobic conditions when you're gasping for air, but it could also happen metabolically. For example, if you have a defect in pyruvate dehydrogenase, this is a autosomal recessive disease known as pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. And what happens is that the pyruvate builds up in the cytoplasm because it can't be properly oxidized in the mitochondria. And since pyruvate can be reduced to lactate, what happens is that the NADH that's formed in glycolysis will actually get oxidized to NAD+, where it recirculates back to perform another round of glycolytic oxidation of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Remember that glycolysis performs substrate-level phosphorylation, although not shown here, you can make ATPs. So you're still making a few ATPs, but you can't oxidize your carbon completely. You're anaerobic and you build up lactic acid. So anytime you see a patient with lactic acidosis, you have to think about, is their mitochondria defective or what other means could, you, could be happening that you have lactic acidosis? There's also metabolic acidosis and in the form of using drugs. I showed you metformin here. We have a number of things on our website about metformin. This is probably one of the most commonly prescribed drugs on earth. There's hundreds of millions of people taking this diabetic drug. And what it does, it inhibits gluconeogenesis. And by inhibiting gluconeogenesis, what you can do is reduce the hyperglycemia typical of diabetics. And so what this does though, it inhibits indirectly uh, fructose bisphosphatase 1, this gluconeogenic enzyme that hydrolyzes fructose 1 by phosphate to fructose 6. And if you inhibit this, what you do is you build up all these gluconeogenic intermediates here and you build up pyruvate. Here's the equation for gluconeogenesis. You should commit that to memory. The AAMC MCAT content outline specifically asks for that kind of stuff. So we build up pyruvate, and you know what happens when we build too much pyruvate? We form lactic acid, and you get metabolic acidosis. So it shouldn't su surprise you that one of the contraindications for metformin, or the side effects, I should say, is lactic acidosis. And so then what do you do about metabolic acidosis? Well, you know, what happens is that you can change your breathing rate to actually get rid of more CO2, you can hyperventilate. That's one way, that's the first response, but more prolonged chronic metabolic acidosis, that's where the kidney comes in. And what we see here then with metabolic acidosis, the goal of the kidney is to raise blood pH levels. So how do you do that? So what we do is we use the amino acid glutamine. So in what happens in the lumen, we have transporters that bring it into the proximal tubule and from the blood, you bring in glutamine. So glutamine is a nitrogen carrier. Yes, it's an amino acid that goes into proteins, but you should also appreciate it as a nitrogen carrier. And here it has two amino nitrogen groups. So we're gonna link nitrogen to blood pH levels. And so then you bring it in by transporters and the kidney as well as other tissues have an enzyme called glutaminase, which actually cuts off an ammonia here. Ammonium, I should say, ammonium is actually a weak acid. So we made an acid. And then what happens then is you make glutamate. So glutamine has two nitrogens, glutamate has one. And so glutamate dehydrogenase will strip off the second one. You make ammonia and bicarbonate. And what you can see happen very, very cleverly, what the kidney does, it has bicarbonate symporters, which takes the bicarbonate to the blood, which does what? Raises the pH, perfect for metabolic acidosis. But over here, it has an antiporter that kicks out the ammonium ion into the lumen, which we know will go into the urine. And so we see how pH is linked to nitrogen balance here. And we're gonna show you a really cool passage that has uh, these enzymes used to solve your acid-base chemical needs. So let's take a further look at nitrogen balance and pH over here. What we see is that we have the amino acid serine converted in to its cognate alpha keto acid derivative. And what happens is that these transaminase enzymes, these vitamin B6 dependent enzymes actually are very important in nitrogen and pH balance. What they do is they swap the nitrogen group 
off the amino acid, put it onto alpha ketoglutarate to make glutamate and they make their cognate alpha keto acid. So the amino group that was once on serine is now on the nitrogen carrier glutamate. And what you can do is take that glutamate nitrogen and kick off ammonium in the mitochondria, but ammonium's toxic. You don't want free ammonium around too long. So what you do is you rapidly convert it into carbamyl phosphate using ATP and CO2, and you make this high energy phosphoanhydride that's carrying a nitrogen. So notice that the nitrogen that was once on serine is now on carbamyl phosphate. And in order to get rid of it, what we do, we put it into the urea cycle here. I don't wanna sweat the details too much, but what we end up doing is we make urea, which has two nitrogens where one came from the serine from carbamyl phosphate, the other one comes from aspartic acid. Notice it takes a lot of energy to make urea and also notice that arginine, the amino acid is made in the urea cycle. So arginine is not an essential amino acid. Doctors commonly measure bun or blood urea nitrogen and that could be in indicative of a unhealthy liver because the urea cycle only occurs in the liver but bun is also used to measure renal function as well. So basically you can have ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. This is a, a, auto, a, this is a sex link, it's an X link recessive basically. And it's, it's the most common inborn error metabolism in the urea cycle. And what you see here is when you can't put in carbamyl phosphate, what happens is that it builds up and you can hydrolyze this and you have all of this nitrogen, this ammonium building up. Now ammonium, true, it's a weak acid, but what happens is that ammonium is actually a neurotoxin and it stimulates the brain to hyperventilate because what you wanna do is you wanna breathe more, you wanna exhale more to get rid of this acid so that you can raise your pH. And so that's where the lungs will come in. So ammonium, it's hyperammonemia is what it's called. So now we're gonna do some workshop passages. We're gonna look at some acid-based chemistry in the context of physiology and biochemistry. And of course you have to use all your G-chem skills at the same time. So let's get going on the workshops.